I want to thank all of you for your sweet comments and tweets and emails of encouragement. We really are in this together. I'm so glad to hear that you are safe and well. Let's keep up the good work of staying home and staying safe. A reminder of what I said last week. There has been an increase in suicides during this troubling, unprecedented time. If you're experiencing suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. There has also been a spike in domestic violence and child abuse. If you do not feel safe in quarantine, please call 1-800-799-SAFE or 7233. Or you can dial 911 and just leave the line open if that's all you can do. Remember, you are not alone. There are resources. Please reach out if you need help. I'll have international resources as well as these U.S. numbers in today's show notes. Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Today's case is about sexual assault and an especially graphic murder. Listener discretion is strongly advised. It's a beautiful Saturday night in Conway, South Carolina. It stays in the 70s here, even midway into November so I still mostly have my summer tan. Nights can be chilly, but I barely even need the light jacket I brought with me. I'm 17 years old, and my curfew isn't until 12.30. I just got my car back, and I'm itching to go somewhere. I'm not really in a partying mood. I just don't want to go home. I want to hang out with my friends. I'm a little disappointed. I had plans with my cousin, but he forgot to call me back. And I also hoped to get a call from a boy I like, but he didn't call. So I go to the mall and wait for my best friend Carla to get off work. She comes out at 9 p.m., a little tired, but she's a good friend. She just asks where. We head out to a party I know about, and I'm miserable almost immediately when we get there. A boy, who I've been out with a few times, is there with another girl. He ignores me. My best friend hates him. She thinks he uses me. She's probably right. We decide to leave after this. By now, it's almost her curfew. But I still have an hour. I tell Carla I'll probably just pick up some food and go home. And then I tell her goodnight. She's the last person to see me alive, except the boy who is going to kill me. Welcome to episode 93, The Rape and Murder of Crystal Fay Todd. Conway, South Carolina is often called Rivertown or Historic Rivertown because it lies on the western banks of the Waccamaw River. It's also in the South Carolina coastal plain, just 14 miles or 23 kilometers from the Atlantic Ocean and the white sand beaches of Myrtle Beach. It's one of the oldest towns in South Carolina, first established in 1732 as part of Royal Governor Robert Johnson's township. It was called Kingstown, though soon shortened to Kingston, and many original settlers fought in the Revolutionary War. After the war, they wanted to ditch the name honoring Great Britain's King George II. It was changed to Ori in honor of a revolutionary general, but later, That was made a county name, and the town was named after another general, Robert Conway. And if I mispronounced Ori, go yell at some YouTube people. I do try, y'all, I swear. In 1991, when Crystal was murdered, the town had less than 10,000 residents. So definitely your small town, everyone knows everyone type of place to grow up. There wasn't much to do for teenagers back then except go to high school football games in the fall, though, of course, the summer was for the beach. There were usually parties, outside of town limits, keg parties for teenagers. Crystal was no stranger to them. Like most teens, they want to hang out away from parents and do that teenage ritual of acting old enough to handle your beer 
and pretending not to notice the boy or girl you like. Crystal would have been my age. I remember this kind of small town life vividly. At 17, she had already crashed into a telephone pole with her new car and was initially charged with a DUI. She said she had only had a few beers, but she had definitely learned her lesson. Her car was her pride and joy. And I'm definitely not condoning drinking and driving or excusing her behavior. Authors Dale Hudson and Billy Hills found out that police told Crystal they would drop the charges if she would become a criminal informant. But she refused. She didn't want to, quote, rat on her friends. Despite not working with the police, the charge was reduced to minor possession of alcohol, and she lost her license for three months. But as I said, she did learn her lesson. She rarely drank after this, and if she did, her friend Carla said she might just nurse one beer. Her mother, Bonnie Faye Todd, had given her the brand new 1991 Toyota Celica as an early graduation present, and Crystal loved her car and the freedom it gave her. Despite the near DUI, Crystal was a good girl. Even good girls make mistakes. She was born on January 4th, 1974 in Conway in the Juniper Bay area. And she was her mama's miracle. Bonnie Faye Todd had always wanted to have a baby, but thought she couldn't. She had Crystal when she was 39 years old with her husband, Junior B. Todd. But Junior died in 1985 just a few weeks after Crystal turned 11. So Bonnie Faye, or Miss Bonnie, as many townspeople called her, raised Crystal by herself, and her daughter was her whole world. Crystal was involved with church and sang in the youth choir, but she also took care of the house. In a sense, she and Miss Bonnie took care of each other. Crystal was a neat freak, and she liked to cook so she did most of the household chores in the small trailer they lived in. Crystal hated cigarette smoke, and her mother did smoke in the house, so she was constantly cleaning and airing it out. And she did not like for her mother to smoke in her car either. When she did, Crystal immediately cleaned and aired it out too. She is described by her cousin Kevin as a lively girl with a good sense of humor. He said she was very social and outgoing. She was a cute brunette with olive skin that was often deeply tanned. In November of 1991, Crystal was a senior at Conway High School. She would have graduated in 1992. That's the year I graduated. I look at photos of Crystal and her hair and clothing and jewelry, and it really takes me back. Aside from her best friend Carla, she had many other friends. One was Ken Register. They grew up together, and he lived only a mile from her. Though they dated briefly in 1988, they had decided they were better as friends. Ken would later say Crystal was shy until she started partying in high school. He hinted that she did drugs and slept around. According to the book, An Hour to Kill, Ken felt his relationship with Crystal was more like a brother and sister. He often gave her rides to school because they lived so close but he stopped because his buddies on the football team teased him about it, saying he really liked her. Ken's full name was Johnny Kenneth Register II. He was born April 13, 1973, to parents Kenneth and Shirley. He had already graduated from Conway High School, where he played football and was considered an above-average student. Like Crystal, he was very involved with his church. His whole family was. He and his father had recently built a new altar, and Ken led the music for the small church. He stood five foot eight inches tall and was blonde haired and blue eyed. He was considered good looking at the time. Ken would later say that he often partied in high school, but in the beginning of 1991, he met and started dating a 15 year old girl, and she did not approve of drinking or partying, so he vowed to change his ways for her. On the night of November 16th, 1991, Ken had been at the go-kart track in Aner, 20 minutes from Conway, with his girlfriend. The girlfriend would later say he had nagged her all night about leaving early. 
He had spent that Saturday afternoon boating with friends at the river landing. It was so warm, he had a sunburn. His girlfriend would later tell authors Hudson and Hills, who wrote An Hour to Kill, that he was agitated all night. They report in the book that she was actually 14 at the time, though news reports later say 15. Her real name was printed in newspapers, and the authors used a pseudonym. I'm just going to call her the girlfriend. She said that Ken was cold that night, even though it had been a warm day. He had worn dock siders without socks and a light shirt over his sunburn, which added to his discomfort. So he complained most of the evening and kept trying to get his girlfriend to leave. But at 14, her curfew was 11 o'clock. If she left, she would be at home right next door to the racetrack, but not allowed to come back out. Her parents worked at the racetrack, called the Dodge City Park Raceway. So she was allowed to stay out later as long as she was where they were. But Ken kept nagging her and behaved jealously when she talked to friends. You would think Anor and Conway, only 20 minutes apart, might have some of the same social circles, but they didn't. The girlfriend told authors Hudson and Hills that he didn't know most of the people she said hi to, and he just wanted to leave. His curfew was 12.30. If he took her home, they would have at least an hour alone before he had to go home. But she didn't want to leave. Even though the final race was going on, she would stay and mill around with her friends as her parents closed up. She said she walked Ken to his car and kissed him goodbye. It was around 11 o'clock. That's the same time that Crystal and Carla left their party. Carla's curfew was 11.15, so they were cutting it close. It was already 11.15 when Crystal brought Carla back to her car at the mall. Ken Register and Crystal Todd were now out riding around Conway at around the same time. Though exact times were later disputed, there is no question the friends met up. We will never really know what exactly happened after that because we only have Ken's story, which he later took back. But he was the last person to see Crystal Faye Todd alive. I'm going to pause now for a short commercial break. By 3.30 a.m. the following morning, when Crystal hadn't returned, Bonnie Todd couldn't take the worry any longer. She had called a few of Crystal's friends. Carla told her when she last saw Crystal, and she even spoke with Ken Register around 1.15 a.m., who said he had not seen her that night, but did know of a few parties going on. With no luck, a distraught Bonnie called 911 at 3.30 a.m. The dispatcher actually knew her and Crystal, and he tried to reassure her that Crystal had just missed her curfew and would turn up. Bonnie hung up not feeling much better. She was worried sick. Crystal would call if she was going to be late, and none of the friends she normally hung around with had seen her after 11 p.m. By 8 a.m., she was frantic and called 911 again. This time, they sent out a patrol officer to file a missing persons report. Not long after 9 a.m., two hunters were out on Collins Jolly Road and they spotted a trail of blood. They thought a deer had already been shot and ran across the road. But looking closer, they saw that it looked like drag marks and too much blood. Then one of the hunters spotted what he thought was a shoe hanging over the ditch. Then he realized it was attached to an ankle. The men looked in the ditch and saw a body lying on its side. There was so much blood, but with just a quick look, the men could see it was a woman and she had been severely mutilated. One of the hunters lost his breakfast, and they both stepped back gingerly, aware it was a crime scene. They got back in their truck and raced to their sister's house, not far away, and called 911. Detective Bill Knowles was paged right away as he was heading into church. It was urgent. He called in and found out what was going on and then told his wife not to expect him back for a while. That was going to be an understatement. He got to the scene and officers had already cordoned it off. There were pools of blood on the dirt road and he already saw tire tracks and footprints. 
He knew the hunters had found the body, but also knew that even though they had carefully stepped back, they had already compromised the scene with their tire tracks. The evidence team immediately requested assistance from SLED, State Law Enforcement Division, but they couldn't get there until that afternoon. So the local evidence team got to work. A crowd was gathering around the crime scene. They knew they had to remove her body. Not just because of onlookers, but because of the heat. It was in the high 70s again that day, and they were worried about any DNA being degraded. They carefully photographed and videotaped the scene before removing her. Though she wasn't positively identified right away, there were already whispers. When they moved her body, they found a class ring on her finger. Crystal Fay Todd was engraved on the inside. One of the officers said to cancel the missing person's report and to get someone over to Bonnie Todd's house immediately. Detective Knowles went personally to inform Miss Bonnie. According to authors Hudson and Hills, she held her composure long enough to invite him and two other officers in the house until she broke down sobbing. Back at the crime scene, investigators determined Crystal had fought with her attacker in one place where there was a large pool of blood and then dragged to the ditch. It was horrific. It was obviously a sexual assault case, as well as murder. Her jeans were unbuttoned and slid down from her hips. Her shirt was torn open and so was her bra, leaving her breasts exposed. Her hair was drenched in blood. Her face was covered with it. Her throat had been slashed twice, and there were many other cuts on her face. And she had been disemboweled. Part of her intestines and other organs protruded from her body. The autopsy found that she had at least 35 stab wounds or cuts, seven bruises, and three abrasions on her body. Two stab wounds were in her back, and they went deep enough to pierce her spinal cord. She had defense wounds on her left hand, which was odd, as Crystal was right-handed but the autopsy found that the knife used to kill Crystal had gone right into the left side of her head, piercing through her skull into her brain, likely paralyzing the right side of her body. She actually had three stab wounds pierced that side of her skull. The medical examiner was amazed. You almost never see a stab wound pierce a skull with that much force, much less three. Meaning, even after being stabbed in the head and partially paralyzed, she was still trying to fight for her life. And it was overkill. Many of the wounds had no blood, which meant the killer kept stabbing even after she died. And she had been brutally raped. Semen was found in her mouth, anus, and vagina. There was significant bruising to her vagina and anus, probably from a blunt force object. This had been a horrific and frenzied attack. And there was much evidence that Crystal was still alive through most of it. Only a few of the stab wounds and cuts had no blood. The semen found was from a man with type O blood with a rare subtype, PGM. The DNA profile was also rare, occurring in one in every 250 million Caucasians and only one in 1.5 billion African Americans. When they found who murdered her, there would be a definitive match to this DNA. The murder weapon was determined to most likely be an old-timer knife with a 3.5-inch blade, a jagged hunting knife with a lock blade. The murder and mutilation of Crystal Todd was so vicious that the police even considered possible satanic connections. This was 1991, and the satanic panic of the 80s and 90s was not over. But local cops quickly dismissed this theory. Bonnie Todd was adamant that her daughter would not have willingly gotten into a car with strangers. By now, her car was found parked at the local middle school with her purse and jacket still inside the locked car. It looked like she left the car there willingly. Back at Bonnie Todd's that first awful day, Carla, her best friend, arrived and found Crystal's cousin Kevin outside smoking. He was beside himself with guilt because he had not called her back that night. 
according to the book An Hour to Kill, Ken Register was also there and was vomiting in the bushes. But he was among the first people to come and comfort Miss Bonnie, and he would check in on her every day after that. Ken Register also served as a pallbearer at her funeral, and he was seen on video placing his boutonniere on her coffin before it was lowered into the ground. Some 1,500 people showed up for the open casket visitation. Her friends found it difficult to believe what she had been through when they saw her lying peacefully in the coffin. The rumors of what had happened to Crystal were awful, but that's what morticians do, and evidently, they had taken very good care of Crystal. In a Forensic Files episode on the case, there's a video inside the funeral home, and you can see her in the coffin. Her neck is carefully hidden. Crystal was buried at the High Point Baptist Church Cemetery in Conway. In the week after the discovery of her body, police followed up with 200 leads. There was a $10,000 reward offered, almost $19,000 today, funded by the county and the local Crime Stoppers. It was the biggest murder investigation in the history of the department. Lead investigator Bill Knowles had recently graduated from the FBI Academy and he wanted to bring in a professional profiler. David Caldwell, a behavioral analyst from SLED, was brought in. The full profile is printed in the book An Hour to Kill, and it is extremely detailed. And much of it was spot on. But the main characteristics were a white male, aged 20 to 25. He had to be very strong and probably had a previous criminal record. He would be known to Crystal and was not likely considered a suspect. After this, police collected samples from 52 men Crystal knew, many from her high school. They all donated willingly. There was only one man who showed any anxiety about giving his blood sample, and that was Ken Register. And he did not act that way in front of police, but incredibly, in front of Bonnie Faye Todd. He talked to Miss Bonnie about his fears, claiming that since the police hadn't found anyone yet, they were looking to pin it on someone. Bonnie assured him that everything would be fine, but he insisted the tests weren't reliable. He even sulked and made remarks about faking the test. At the time, Bonnie laughed at him. But after he left the house, she realized how strange he had behaved, and she was suspicious of him as soon as he walked out the door. She called Detective Knowles with her suspicions. She called every day, and even though they were working 16-hour shifts, they never minded talking to her. Crystal's murder felt personal to the whole town, including the police. Now Bonnie called with a suspect. Police had already arranged a meeting with Ken to talk to him and get a blood sample. When they first went to his house, he wasn't home, so they left a card. And that's when he had gone whining to Miss Bonnie. He came in the next day and behaved normally at first. He flatly denied ever having sex with Crystal, even when they dated back in 1988. But he was more than happy to tell the detectives that her reputation was that she was loose. But he quickly insisted that he didn't believe all that stuff, and guys liked to brag. When they asked him for his blood, he said, what for? And they told him for DNA comparisons. Then he said, what is DNA? He actually asked the officers if he could talk to his mother about it first. They said sure, but then told him that every other man who had been asked to give blood had consented right away, basically hinting that he was acting suspicious. So he went voluntarily to the hospital and had his blood drawn. He also gave samples of his saliva, hair, pubic hair, finger, and palm prints. These samples were then compared to the evidence left on Crystal's body. When the tests were run, there was a nine-band match between Ken's samples and the semen in evidence. This is very rare. Later at trial, an expert testified that most bands observed to match between two individuals had been three out of nine, and it was extraordinary to have a nine-band match. As the first analysts had said, The DNA was a rare type, and his match proved it. Only one man and 250 million 
would match this type. You don't get much better of a positive identification. Ken Register had never heard of DNA before, but he was already worried about blood typing. I'm going to pause here for a word from today's sponsor. Police would later publicly comment that without the DNA matching Crystal's case, it probably never would have been solved. There were no fingerprints or even fiber evidence found at the scene. She did have bloody fingerprints on the backs of her arms, probably from when she was dragged across the dirt road. But there were not enough ridges formed to get a print that would match. Though crime scene investigators had taken molds of shoe prints and of tire tracks, no matches were found. Without his DNA, Ken Register probably would have gotten away with it. Detective Knowles later said he was dumbfounded when the test came back, despite Bonnie Faye's suspicions. He was right under our noses, he told authors Hudson and Hills. But he also knew that without a confession, it would still be hard to convict Ken Register. Many people, not just Ken, had never even heard of DNA. Crystal's case was the first one in South Carolina to use DNA. Most of us didn't come to understand DNA until the O.J. Simpson case. Even though it was first used in court in 1986, it still was not widely used by 1991. O.J. Simpson didn't go to trial until 1995. It's hard for us to believe it in the year 2020. We believe in DNA now. Fingerprints had been our source of positive identification for a century. It took time to convince people. And high-profile cases like O.J. Simpson's helped with our collective acceptance of DNA as evidence, even though the jury failed to convict him. I've said many times how much I love circumstantial evidence, because juries like it. They want to picture the story. Scientific data is much harder to process and it would be no different in Ken Register's trial, but we will get to that. Detective Knowles and officers arrested Ken Register at his job at Sante Cooper Electric on February 18, 1992. When the detective told his supervisor who they wanted to talk to, Ken immediately shouted, I didn't have anything to do with it. And he kept this up as he was led out of the building. He reportedly said, I ain't done nothing. I want to call my mama. Soon his anger turned into tears and he kept asking for his mama. He was interrogated from 10.20 a.m. to 1.30 p.m., incessantly asking for his mama, insisting that she could clear this up. Ken Register believed his mama would work as an alibi. The detectives kept telling him later, later we'll let you call her and they kept at him. They told Ken that he had been seen that night with Crystal and that they had his tire tracks, shoe prints, and fingerprints from the scene. None of this was true, but it's perfectly legal for detectives to lie to a suspect as long as they are not threatening violence or using any direct or implied promises of a lighter sentence. Ken finally broke down and said he wouldn't tell them about it until he talked to his mama. Police stopped the interview and went to talk to Ken Register's mother. She declined to go to the police station to see Ken. Instead, she wrote him a note that said, Ken, I love you. I know where you were at. We know when you left the racetrack, and I know when you got home. I'll stand by you. I love you, Mama. Evidently, his mama did plan to be his alibi. Police got back to the station at around 2.20 p.m. and told Ken they had talked to his mother. Police did not give Ken his mother's letter. Instead, they said his mother was upset and that she loved him and that she wanted him to tell police what happened that night, to tell the truth. This finally is what got Ken to talk, especially once Detective Knowles asked Ken if he had asked God to forgive him for what he had done. Ken started sobbing and said yes, he had. It was now 3 p.m., the detective asked Ken if he could turn on the tape recorder. They wanted him to cooperate at any cost, so they were being careful. There were plenty of men in the room to witness the confession. 
Ken said, no, don't turn it on. He proceeded to tell the story that he had met up with Crystal that night and she had gotten his car. They went out to Collier Jolly Road and Ken claimed they had consensual sex, but he said he didn't use a condom and Crystal got mad when he ejaculated inside of her. He said she began to hit him in the chest and then jumped out of the car to put her clothes back on, screaming at him that if he got her pregnant, she would tell everyone that he raped her. Ken claimed he was confused and angry and just wanted her to stop screaming, so he pulled the hunting knife out of the compartment between the seats of his car and got out and started stabbing her. The detectives asked for more details, but Ken said he had been too frantic and couldn't remember everything. He said he was very scared about what he had done and dragged Crystal's body from beside his car to the ditch. And then he said he threw the knife as far away as he could. And then he drove home as fast as he could. Now, there are many problems with this confession. First of all, the autopsy showed that the vaginal rape was just as violent as everything else done to Crystal. It was not consensual, and he makes no mention of the oral or anal rape, and he actually made it sound as though Crystal was at fault. During his confession, other officers searched Ken's family home and his car. They found the box the knife came in, and though he had done a very good job of cleaning his car, there were traces of blood found on the steering wheel, gear shift, and door handles. News of Ken's arrest rocked Conway. The townsfolk just couldn't believe it. He was known as a good Christian boy, a hard worker. He was one of Crystal's best friends. He had been a damn pallbearer at her funeral. The police just couldn't have gotten it right, they insisted. But police knew they were right. As they took a good look into Ken's past, they found out he wasn't the choir boy everybody thought he was. When Ken was 15 years old, he was working at his uncle's auto repair shop. A young woman named Julie came in and spoke with Ken when she picked up her car and paid her bill. Not long after, she and her mother, because she still lived at home, began receiving obscene phone calls. It was mostly Julie who got the calls, but her mom got some too, just not as bad as what was said to Julie. Julie and her mother asked the phone company to trace the calls, but they could only tell the general area the calls came from. I'm not sure why they didn't report it to the police, who even by then had more sophisticated methods for tracing calls, but they didn't. Instead, Julie decided she would start responding to the creep in hopes that if she kept him talking, she could figure out who it was. They suspected it had to be someone who knew them. And it finally paid off. She kept him on the phone long enough one day that she heard the sounds from the garage where she had taken her car. She went down there, and Ken's uncle apologized, but said there was no one there that would do such a thing. But Julie got a look at Ken and remembered him. She found out who he was and called his house that night. Sure enough, she recognized his voice. After this, she did call the police, and they arrested 15-year-old Ken Register. Because he was a minor, he was released to the custody of his sister. His file was turned over to the Department of Youth Services. Over three years later, when Julie saw that Ken Register had been arrested for the rape and murder of a girl, she called the officers and told them what had happened. She wanted to know what had happened to his case in the juvenile system. But the department said they did not have a file on him. And interestingly, Ken Register's aunt happened to work there. What troubled police the most was what he had said to Julie. He specifically said things like, I'm going to make you scream. I'm going to fuck you, and I'm going to cut you open. He made a lot of references to anal rape, as well as using other foreign objects on her. This was all disturbingly similar to what he had done to Crystal. Police also quickly found he had a more recent record. Less than two months before he raped and murdered Crystal, Ken exposed himself to two girls at the Coastal Carolina College campus. He pulled up, asked for directions, and then unzipped his pants and touched himself. They yelled at him and walked away, but one of them was smart. As he drove off, she yelled, wait, and he hit the brakes. 
and then she got his license number. Ken was arrested for indecent exposure after the women chose him out of a lineup. His court date hadn't even happened before he murdered Crystal. There were other incidents, too. His high school football coach spoke of his disturbing temper. Co-workers told of his predilection for porn magazines. He never brought them home, but kept them in his car, where he would show his fellow workers. And the worst, Bonnie Faye Todd said that about a week before Crystal's murder, she told her mother that Ken was asking her to date him again. She complained to her mom that she didn't want to date him because he reeked of cigarette smoke and all he wanted was sex. Bonnie hadn't thought much of it at the time. I'm sure she thought he was just a horny teenager. And Crystal notoriously hated cigarette smoke. When the prosecutor found out about the indecent exposure charge, he pushed the court date back on Crystal's case so Ken would go to court for this first. It could be used against him in the murder trial. Ken was quickly found guilty in the indecent exposure case, though I could not find what his sentence was. Finally, in April of 1992, Ken was indicted for first-degree murder, first-degree criminal sexual conduct, kidnapping, buggery, and sodomy. When he was indicted was the first time that the town of Conway found out he had confessed. All of the sudden, their good hometown boy became a monster and his family became pariahs. In June of 1992, before his trial the following January, Crystal's class graduated without her. They left an empty seat where she would have sat and placed two white roses on her chair. Her friends also raised money for Crystal's headstone. She had one, but an extra piece was added. I'll have it on social media to show you. His trial started on January 13th, 1993. The prosecution's case was based mainly on Ken's confession and the DNA evidence. The defense's case was that Ken had an alibi for the night of the murder. He was in Aner with his girlfriend. He left Aner around 11.35 p.m. and got home to his mom's house at 12.15 a.m. Ken, his mother, and girlfriend all testified to these exact same times. Bonnie Faye Todd also testified and was an excellent witness despite her grief. She was angry and she was specific and she remembered everything. She told the jury what her daughter had told her the week before her death. And more importantly, she told the jury that when she called Ken at 1.13 a.m. after Crystal didn't come home that night, he told her on the phone that he had just walked in the door. This directly contradicted his mama's alibi for him who said he came in at 12.15. Bonnie later was interviewed for several documentaries, and on the forensic files, she said that if Shirley Register had really seen her son come home that night, then she would have had to see him covered in blood. Experts say there was no way he would not have been covered in Crystal's blood. He stabbed her to death and literally disemboweled her for the love of God. Bonnie Faye had a point, and she said, quote, if she helped clean him up, she's got Crystal's blood on her hands, too. It's also possible Shirley Register lied and never saw her son come home that night. Naturally, at trial, Ken rescinded most of his confession. He did testify on his own behalf, which did not help his case, because while he didn't lose his cool, his emotionless demeanor was not lost on the jury. As with the Bobby Joe Stennett murder trial in episode 90, the prosecution came to court with big guns. They had also hired the famed Dr. Park Dietz, the man who had testified against John Hinckley Jr. and Jeffrey Dahmer, now explained to this jury what a sexual sadist was. And Dr. Dietz is a very effective witness. The jury also heard extremely graphic testimony, along with photographs of what Ken had done to Crystal. One juror had to be excused after an expert explained that Crystal's anus was stretched out but had not contracted, indicating that she was alive and being stabbed to death as she was anally raped. I apologize for this graphic explanation, but it was chilling testimony and illustrates just how violent and horrific Crystal's rape and murder was. On January 22nd, 
1993, Ken Register was convicted on all charges. However, on January 25th, even though he was found guilty in a capital murder case, he was sentenced to life in prison, and he got 30 years each for all the other charges to be served consecutively. Jurors later said they just could not sentence him to death because he was 18 at the time. The jury also reported that they did find the DNA evidence to be confusing, so they put it aside and looked at all of the character testimony, Dr. Dietz, and of course, Ken's own poor performance on the stand. If Crystal was his best friend, wouldn't he have cried? Wouldn't he have been adamant that he couldn't have done this to her? That's not the Ken Register they saw on the stand. Ken, of course, appealed to the Supreme Court of South Carolina and said his conviction should be overturned because it was based solely on a false, coerced confession and DNA evidence. On August 12, 1996, Ken's appeal was denied. Ken's mother still says she believes he is innocent, despite how many times they have retested his DNA. I just bet she does. Ken is currently imprisoned at Broad River Correctional Institute in Columbia, South Carolina. He is eligible for parole on February 18th, 2022. That date really startled me. That's less than two years from now. For anyone convicted of these types of crimes before 1996 in the state of South Carolina, they are eligible for parole after serving a third of their sentence. Friends and family of the Todds plan to write letters to the parole board and do everything they can to stop him from getting out. In most states, you have to fully allocute and take responsibility for what you were charged for or you were denied parole. Ken Register has always denied responsibility. But I have a feeling at the finish line, he might just tell the damn truth. We just have to hope and pray the parole board does the right thing. That monster should never see the light of day. Miss Bonnie Faye Todd passed away in September of 2014 at the age of 79. Detective Bill Knowles maintained a friendship with Bonnie after the trial. He said, quote, There's no question in my mind the loss of her daughter devastated her more so than any other family member I've ever dealt with. On the Forensic Files episode, Bonnie said, quote, I just exist. I have no life. Her words just broke me. Crystal was her life, and Ken Register destroyed it. While researching Crystal's case, I looked at her senior photo first, the one that went in the yearbook, even though she didn't get to graduate, and I felt so hollow. I also graduated in the class of 1992. Maybe it's because I've seen all the recent class photos on Facebook lately in support of our 2020 seniors. But Crystal looks like my friends in her photo. Her hair, her smile, everything. Crystal would be my age now. She would probably have children of her own, maybe even grandchildren. I am glad Miss Bonnie has already passed on and is reunited with her beloved daughter. She was miserable for 23 years after losing her girl. And it's possible that son of a bitch who brutally raped and killed her daughter will be free in less than two years. I'm grateful she didn't live to see that happen. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic artist by Coley Horner and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. Thank you to Haley Gray and Jessica Ann for their research assistance in this case. And I recommend reading An Hour to Kill by Dale Hudson and Billy Hills. It's an excellent account of this atrocious murder that so shook the small town of Conway, South Carolina, with much more insider detail than I could provide. And thank you to Catania Brown for suggesting this case. Also, I apologize if my voice is a bit raspy. The pollen in Tennessee is bad this year. Y'all, let's keep up practicing social distancing. Experts say it's working. I know people are going stir crazy, and I know it is really difficult financially. But the longer we hang on to flatten the curve, the better our chances are. And thank you so much to our essential and frontline healthcare workers. 
The word hero is thrown around a lot, and I don't think that begins to cover it. I'm so grateful for everyone, from grocery workers to healthcare workers, and all those in between. They are putting their lives on the line for us. The least we can do is try to help by staying home and staying safe. And if you're bored, come join my Facebook group. It's not all grim true crime. We share memes and a lot of laughs. I've shared a couple of recipes and lots of people shared some of their own. It's a lovely community and we'd love to have you. And please, if you're suffering from abuse in quarantine or having suicidal thoughts, please look at today's show notes for resources. You are not alone. I also have sexual assault resources in the show notes. They may not have helped Crystal, but they might help you or someone you know. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like Stitcher and Spotify, as well as Stitcher Premium, where you can listen ad-free. If you have any case suggestions, please email southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I'm sorry, but I no longer answer private messages on social media. I manage three platforms and it's too overwhelming. But please feel free to reach out by email. Not only do I get my most interesting and little known cases from listener suggestions, I love hearing from you guys. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Wash your hands, stop touching your face, and y'all take care.